What's going on, guys? Welcome to the latest episode of Can I Kick It? On today's episode, we have Chop Soccer Pod joining us to break down the interesting dynamic of the brothers Jerome Broitain and Kevin Pence Broitain. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And with that being said, I'm going to let y'all introduce yourselves. I don't know why I said that twice. <laughs> Can I go first? Yeah, uh, but hold on, hold on. Before we get started, there's a disclaimer. Uh, Rox and I are not brothers. Let's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let, like let's make sure that's true. Y'all not brothers. Yeah, let's we're make not sure brothers. That's... We brothers, but we not brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not before before we get you know how they the all, comment. you know what they say, all yeah. black people look alike, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's why we was nipping it. That's why we was nipping it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We up, though. Microphone check. One, two. What is this? It's Chop Soccer Pod and Can I Kick It? Oh, uh, yeah, it's your boy Rox Fontaine. You already know what time it is. Yo, it's your boy Ken, other uh, third of the Chop Soccer podcast. Big shout out to Shanoa. She's not here right now. She's holding it down, making that coin in LA. You know how it go. Yep. Yeah, man. You know, real quick before we get into you know this dynamic that we're talking about, can you let the listeners know like what is Chop Soccer podcast? Because it's not like your conventional like tactics breaking down soccer. Like Fuck you guys are shit. totally different in a totally different <laughs> way. So yeah, <laughs> explain to the listeners what is Chop Soccer Pod. Uh, Ken, you got this one. Yeah, 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 I'll take it. So uh, Chop Soccer looks at the culture surrounding chop- soccer, like a hundred percent, right? So like you know, we talk about like totally stuff that has nothing to do with soccer. Then we get into like more cultural stuff. Like you might not hear tactics from us, but you're gonna hear stuff about like you know things surrounding the field, things that are happening to the players, things that are happening in the league. Like you know, we're looking at everything, and then we're just talking about it the way we talk about it in the barber shop, like. You know, we don't filter anything like, you know, we got dope segments, but we're not really out here like, you know, popping it off like, you know, trying to bar your head off of stats or anything like that. You know, it's just a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Our focus is really on like we just felt like the entry point for soccer was too far away for people like us. Right. So, yeah, if you look at the general person that, you know, on the block, like they ain't trying to hear, you know, how many players, you know, and like what league they came from and you know, their XG and all that. They ain't trying to hear all that. They're just like, what is cool about this? Why do I want to pay attention? So our MO was to bring this game and make the entry point culture instead of the game itself. And then you can fall in love with the game by approaching it from this different perspective. So that's where we at with it. Yeah, and we give you everything. We give you soccer fashion. You know, we give you a little bit of front office stuff. Like, you know, foul play, where it's at. We're giving out cards for totally ridiculous stuff. You know, we're out here. Word. That, that's what's up, man. I mean, really, like, a podcast like this is something that's definitely needed out there in, uh, you know, <laughs> black media. I appreciate it because I'll be learning a lot of stuff from y'all about what's been going on culturally and fashionably because I need to get my jersey game back up. Definitely. <laughs> and everything. Um. So let's go ahead and jump into it, man. And actually, the way how this topic all came about is because I think we had a, I think it just came about a random conversation me and Ken had. And we were just talking about like different topics that like something that caught your attention. And Ken yeah. was like, oh, the Boateng brothers. And mind you, like everyone knows about them, but I don't think people really like know about them. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I think really stuck out to me is how both set of bro- like both brothers are both born in Berlin. But one is born in the, I say, poor district of Berlin. I think it's called Wedding. And Jerome, who was born 18 months later to a whole different woman that the father Prince got married to, is born in the wealthier <laughs> district of Berlin. Um, I'm probably going to mess up the name here. What is it? Look at you uh, being fat. Chantlenburg, Wells McDonald. Well, look, I'm a history major, man. I got to make sure my facts are right. Yeah, um, for sure. Look at you. <laughs> But, like, that whole dynamic there, and I'm pretty sure that's something we see in the Black culture already of, like, depending on where you're born on, born at, really can put you on a different course of life. Hell and yeah. You see that with the Boateng brothers, right? Yeah, like, I mean, that's, like, you know, that's kind of the cultural dynamic in general in America. But, like, a lot of people don't even think about it in terms of, like, how it would affect, like, two professional caliber athletes overseas, like, you know, who clearly had the talent. And, like, it's almost like a case study of, like, you know, what happens 
when you put one kid in one neighborhood and then put another kid in another neighborhood 18 months apart, they're practically the same age and see how they turn out, you know? Yeah. Right. And I mean, that look, it, it was a thing growing up that like you always heard it. Like, like, oh, that's your cousin. And you'd be like, like what? I don't know this person. Yeah. Like, oh, you walk somewhere. So this is a funny story. And I'm about to like open up. So when I was 18, my dad, who I've known my entire 18 years of life on this world, walked into my room the day after graduation. It was like, hey, your older brother's outside. Excuse me, what? <laughs> what you mean my <laughs> older brother? <laughs> like, I thought I was the oldest. He was like, nah, I had another kid. It walked out like nothing happened. And I mean, like, that's something that's common in the black community. So imagine like with Jerome and Kevin Prince Boateng, it wasn't as even if they didn't know about each other. They grew up, played with each other. Jerome talked about it. Uh, it was in a Bundesliga article, talked about how he really learned the game of soccer from Kevin Prince and their older brother, George, who was actually like yeah. the true talent in the family. Yeah. And like, uh, so apparently the breakdown was like uh, George and Kevin Prince were from Prince's, their, their father's first like marriage or whatever. And then uh, less than 18 months later, he had another woman pregnant. Well, you know, let's talk about what the get down was on that. <laughs> African king. <laughs> <laughs> but he uh, he had another woman pregnant and that's where Jerome comes from. Right. And a little bit, too, is like the pre money, post money babies. Like facts, you can kind of see that dynamic, like even in like, I guess, households where the husband and wife are still together. Like, look at the Cuomo's, right? Like, um, like who's the guy on CNN? That's uh, Chris. And then his older brother is like uh, Andrew, the governor. Right. You could tell that, like, you know, Andrew came from like, you know, when the Cuomo's were on the come up. Right. You can tell with like George, like, you know, in the situation with the Boatangs, like, you know, he was the one that got in the most trouble because he was probably the one in the raw situation, like when his father first got there or whatever. Right. You know what I mean? And then like as his father established himself a little more and had more kids, each kid had it like subsequently better. Yeah. It's like a stepping ladder. (laughs) Yeah. Like, oh, here's an extra thousand for this kid. Here's an extra thousand for this kid. Yeah, Yeah. because George was in jail. Mm -hmm. I have that same dynamic in in my own real life. Um, I'm my mother and father had me and then my father got married to another woman and had a daughter. So the upbringing between me and my sister completely different. Like I had it rough, rough. And I didn't uh, meet my dad until I was eight. I started living with him when I was already a teenager, 15 or something like that. So at that time, you know, my sister was like uh, 11 or something like that. Not 11. No, she was uh, eight or something like that. She's much younger than me in any case. And uh, her upbringing was like all flowers and lilies and Christmas tree full of presents and all of that was stuff I never saw. So it was just, you know, that nature versus, versus nurture kind of thing. It happens in real life to a bunch of people. So you can only imagine in a situation like this where you're talking about elite athletes both at an elite academy at Hertha Berlin. And then, you know, but their life outside of soccer is completely different. And that affects people in a, in a real way. Yeah, it really does. And when you look at, so both of them, like you said, both of them came through Hertha Berlin. For instance, like, I think it was a U19 award, the Fitz Walter, Fitz Walter Award, which goes to the best U19 player in Germany. Mm-hmm. KP won it. He mm-hmm. leaves. He goes to Tottenham. Next up is Jerome, who finished third. When KP won it, he gets it that year, and then he signs with Berlin. When you look at it that way, why was it up to KP to go on and leave to go on to leave to Tottenham? I mean, naturally, you would think like, oh, well, you're the best UIT player. You already play at Berlin. Stay here, stay at home, play with your brother. But and this is just me thinking like he wanted to go prove himself. He wanted to prove why he was this. He wanted to like almost prove that he's not attached to his dad. Um, and this is just me thinking about, about it in ways of like he wanted to prove that he's a man that he could do it on his own because of where he grew up from, being in a rougher district, knowing that he has to pretty much fight for everything he was. 
And Tottenham is like, hey, it's the EPL. You're making a ton of money. It's kind of like that sample of, hey, I made it. Yeah, like um, when he left to go to Tottenham, like it was a really big deal for like, you know, him at that time. Because, like, you know, he was coming off that Player of the Year award and, like, you know, Jerome was next up. But he was always, like you said, I think he was always going to be the one to kind of branch out and do his own thing. Like, um, when he got dropped from the U21s, like, um, I believe I believe that was a little bit after he went to Tottenham, right? Like, uh, when he got dropped from the U21s. Yeah, it was right around Tottenham. I think it's in between... Tottenham and his loan to Borussia Dortmund. I think it's yeah. somewhere around there. But he got uh, he got dropped from the squad, and then uh, he said that he would never play for Germany again, and ended up going to play for Ghana. Right, like that's something Jerome I don't think would have ever done. Right, yeah. and I don't think he was ever like set up to do that either. You know, Jerome in that instance, because like you know, like if you. I forget which article it was, but uh, one of the articles he was talking about how um, he got to have the best of both worlds in terms of like playing academy from a very young age and then going to go play street soccer with Kevin Prince and George. And it's like, you know, he always had that like, you know, full on view of like, you know, this is how you go into the first team. This is how you succeed and everything else. And like, you know, KP, you know, was brought into that like, you know, a little later on. But like, you know, also like, you know, he had the influence of George who like, you know, was a lot more raw than he was in terms of like, you know, just attitude and having to make it. So like, you know, in a weird way, KP was almost the one stuck in the middle, even though him and Jerome didn't share a mom. Right. And on top of that, you know, like just the, the economics of it again, you know, Jerome's upbringing being away from those two. It goes to show you again that that access that Jerome had matters in the long term. You know, Ber- uh, Berlin and Germany probably felt like actual home to him, right? Because he has access. He's at the academy. He's doing well. His family's stable. He sees his mom. He sees his dad. The other two on the other side of the city, not doing so well financially, having other issues to deal with and not really feeling like this place is home. So it makes perfect sense to me that KP is like, you know what? Like I'm going back to Ghana and try to connect to something. Cause I, that's what I feel that it's really about is KP was at the point where he just really wanted to connect to something and feel valued and included and understood. And he was never going to get that in Germany. Yeah. And I mean, you could even look at like their club careers. I saw Jerome Poitain going to Man City. He pretty much stayed his whole career pretty much in West Germany. Mm-hmm. I don't know the German map like that. You can ask 50 plus Derna. He knows it a lot better than me. But he I think pretty it'd be much, East Germany. Yeah, pro- maybe. He hurts, hurts to Berlin, goes to Hamburg, one year in Man City, comes back, Bayern Munich. Kevin Prince Boateng career is all over the map. You have, get ready for this, hurts to Berlin, Tottenham, Lone Borussia Dortmund, Portsmouth, Genoa, Milan, Schalke, Milan, Las Palmas, Antrek Frankfurt, Sassuolo, Loan to Barcelona, which is insane to me. Transfer to Florentina, goes to Bakshitas alone, then Monza in Serie B. And just in that dynamic, you could tell is like Kevin Prince Boateng is someone to where it's like nothing really feels like home to him. And you know, like you made the point of like he wanted to have something to connect to in Ghana. And he talks about that a lot. Like, I feel like I am Guyanese. I don't feel like I'm German. I don't feel like I, I just happen to be born in Germany. Man, I am. Man. I say Guyanese. Canadian. <laughs> Put him in my the island. <laughs> I know, I did. I did. Oh, Guaguan. Guaguan, <laughs> sorry. Um, but that's where he felt connected to. Where Jerome, you know, and he Jerome comes across as someone that is, I guess, quote unquote, German, where the German is very clean cut. They don't say a whole bunch. They're about efficiency. They're very straight to the point. And that's Jerome's career was. It was. Start off at this club, make your way up to Bayern Munich, win a bunch of Champions League, get crisscrossed by Lionel Messi, win another trouble. <laughs> That's kind of how his career path went. Oh, get the perm. You can't forget the perm. 
Oh yeah, he did have a perm. I forgot all about that. He had the Ooh. little comb over perm, like him and uh, Alibo rocking the little comb over perm. That shit is hella trash, by the way. <laughs> hey man, like uh, there was like a whole time where like the whole Bayern Munich squad was like rocking the comb overs, and that included it was only the black players. It was, that was only, only the black like, players. Oh, it was only the black players. It was only the black players. I thought Lewandowski rocked the comb over for a while, and then. No. Lewandowski yeah. already has the hair to do the do the comb over. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Like he didn't have to perm it, but he I I feel like they were all like perm it, like I feel like they were all doing the same hairstyle, and then like the black players just had to perm their shit. <laughs> it's like the initiation. Like, hey, yeah. look, you gotta let the fro go. You gotta gotta swoosh it. Gotta swoosh it. Gotta swoosh. <laughs> <laughs> gotta hit the bang. Isn't that what they calling it nowadays? Not the bang. <laughs> 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 no, nah, but I, so the other cool thing, thing about the game, I can't talk. Whoa, no, we yeah, got really a did for a while. You just yeah. cut it like a few months ago. Just cut it like a few months ago. Like you see how long my jaw is right now. Yeah, yeah I had the pandemic bang yang for a while. Yeah. It wasn't no bad. See, I got the yeah, pandemic yeah, pulse yeah, the man bun. Yeah. Oh, don't put my man bun. They out spray there. that in. That's all that is. <laughs> Look, man, I can't, I can't get to that point ever in my life. Where, nah, nah, I can never get to that point well. where I have like the the banking. I can't do that. Nah, they not gonna hit you with the ruler in the Beijing. They not gonna. <laughs> nah. <laughs> okay. Oh man, see, this is why I love having y'all on, man. Because <laughs> fans, if y'all have not listened to Chop Soccer Podcast, y'all need to because this is the kind of conversation they be having. <laughs> oh yeah, if y'all not listen to our shit like you, you wildin', bro. <laughs> also, so the crazy thing is about their this this brotherhood is that they are the first set of brothers to you know not play in the World Cup. We've all the, had other brothers playing the World Cup. They're the first set of brothers to play on opposite teams at the World Cup against each other back to back years. I don't know what it was, but there was like you know 2010 World Cup, 2014 World Cup. There was a period where it felt like Germany, Ghana, and America all played each other. Yeah. Like, every, yeah. like yeah. I don't know what it was. They were just like, you know what? Right. These three, y'all play each other. Have fun. Yeah, definitely Ghana and America, man. That shit was oh heartbreak. Right. <sighs> <laughs> that yeah, that that World Cup game was different, man. But like leading up to the World Cup, a lot of people was trying to make so 2010 World Cup. Let's go back in history a little bit. KP was coming in because one, he had the horror tackle against um, his Michael Ballack. Michael Ballack. Michael Ballack. That pretty much ended his international career. Like he's he's yeah. done. Like this is his yeah, last World Cup. He's done. He was supposed to be the captain of that team. Mm-hmm. They had real beef behind that for a long time. <laughs> right. Real and like beef. he even talked about it in the media about like. Yo, like, I'm not trying to be the bad guy. Like, I apologize right after the tackle, but I feel like the media is trying to make me out to be, like, this sinister person of, like, you know, I just go out here and tackle people. Like, I get in the bad boy image. And once again, like, you can see it's really the bad boy image about where he's coming from, you know? And people even talked about it of how even actually Jerome, like, you know, is your per- your brother, like, this bad person? Like, why is he he's out here injuring our national team players? And Jerome the whole time is like, I don't want to talk about it. Once again, you know, German, you know, mantra of like, I don't want to focus on it. I'm focused on the World Cup. I'm here to, you know, win games. And to be honest with you, honestly, I remember watching this game. I thought like something was going to pop off when I found out they were brothers. Like I was like, oh, like he's about to do something dirty, but nothing really happened between them. Bro, if he did that, like that's not okay. Like coming at your brother's neck over some soccer out of pocket man so he did the right thing by not answering questions about it when it was coming up um at the end of the day that's still family and you know real talk like the other thing that can't be ignored in these situations like this is jerome isn't jerome without those other two period he's he was able to develop his game to a different level because he was able to go and play in the streets with them Without that game, he's not the same player. So they're different people. They have different lives. But the three of them 
make the story. It's not any individual that makes the story. Because if it's Jerome by himself, it's like whatever. If it's Kevin Prince by himself, it's like whatever. You know, unlucky player. He hopped all over the place. He, Kevin Prince by himself without the other two is Balotelli, right? <laughs> like it just yeah. kind of is what it is. So, you know what I mean? The the that story goes together, and that relationship with the father, and that you know being of Ghanaian descent but living in Germany and growing up there, all of that matters to the story. So if he would ever come at his brother over soccer and forget all of that history and how special that made them all individually, that would be beyond wild to me. Funny enough, uh, Kevin Prince did spend like a fair amount of his career in Italy, right? Like he had that run where he went like uh, AC Milan, Shaka, AC Milan, and then uh, like a bunch of other Italian clubs. And now he's even in Italy right now, right? So like, you know, on one hand, like, you know, I guess he kind of found a home in Italy the way like uh, Mario Balotelli ultimately did. But another two, it just speaks to like, you know, how much of a path he's taken. Right. Because like that was more than like 10 clubs or whatever. And he never really settled anywhere. Like there's no way right. you play for 10 clubs in 15 years and have more than like two years at a club or something like that. Right. right. Like that's nuts. Especially at that level. It was not like he was bounced around to second division teams. Yeah. Those are major clubs. Yeah. yeah, like somebody was always taking a chance on him because he had talent. It's kind of like, and, <clears throat> you know, you, you mentioned a good point about Balotelli, who also we did an episode on. Like, Balotelli was kind of the same way. It was like he just needed someone to kind of put an arm around him. But Kevin Prince had this aura of, like, I want to do it my way, how I want to do it. And he would quickly, like, get in arguments with managers or there would be heated debates because he wanted to do it his way. He wanted to be a man about it his way. And no knock on Jerome, but Jerome was just more of, and also it, it kind of speaks about it, about the positions they play. Jerome is a center back. KP is an attacker, you know, more flair, more like, you know, more or about him where Jerome is pretty much just like, if my name's not being spoken about, that means I had a good day. You know, normally when you're a center back. Um, but even like to all bring around round to it, they played against each other multiple times other in the career. The 2018 uh DFB Pokal, where KP finally got his first win over his brother. Um, you also had uh the 2014 World Cup where both of them a lot older older. But the crazy thing about it is at the U21 World Cup, um U21 Euros, like like I said earlier, Ken. KP pretty much didn't get selected, not because he wasn't good enough. He was like the very last cut. He got cut because he decided to go to a nightclub, and it was just like, yeah, yeah, you're not, you're not about this. Like you're not, you're not here mentally with us. Like we're here to win. You want to go party, and that's when he decided to go to Ghana. But put you in the what if machine. If he decided not to go to the nightclub, he goes to the U21 Euros that they won. Think about it. He's in a team with Manuel Neuer. Um, Howard as uh, Bojan, his brother, Matt Hummels, Fabian Johnson, who became a U.S. M.E.T., you know, kind of legend, Sam McAdera, Mitchell Ozo. Just imagine, like, if he's in that team, not only does his whole career change, because when you're a German international, German teams are going to take a chance on you versus if you're a Ghanaian, Ghanaian international. Like, just the prospect of, hey, he's a German international. Okay. So instead of him now being at – he was at Borussia Dortmund at this time. He probably stays at Borussia Dortmund because they're going to find a way how to have money for him. So that means not only because he goes to the 2010 World Cup, he you know finishes third in that team. He also then probably gets to go to the Champions League final. That happened probably three years later. Probably he's in that 2014 uh, World Cup winning squad. And we're having Kevin Prince Broating face on FIFA totally different I, world i could plot out a world if he's not chasing coups that night where he goes from tottenham to real madrid oh you gotta let me hear this this, okay. this is all what can i kick it is can i kick it is literally the what if machine okay so uh so check this out um there is a history of maybe three or four people um, going to Real Madrid 
um, from Tottenham roughly starting around the time that Kevin Prince Boateng was uh, at Tottenham, right? So, like, the first player was, uh, I believe one of the first players to go from Tottenham to Real Madrid was Rafael van der Vaart. And then you had Luka Modric. And then you had Gareth Bell. So, like, it's not inconceivable that around the time van der Vaart was there, like, you might want to check this. Van der Vaart might have been there a little before Modric, I believe, but like, I believe Van de Vaart and Kevin Prince Boateng might've been in the same like Tottenham setup or at least around the club at the same time. Um, Cause I believe Van de Vaart was there um, around 2009. So it's quite possible that he goes from Tottenham to Real Madrid just on the hype machine. Like, and that's like, you know, cause they were already looking at that Tottenham squad. Okay, don't worry. I got it backwards. Uh, Van de Vaart went from Real Madrid to Tottenham. Oh, okay, okay. But still, like, that's still an important part. Yeah. I mean, if if it happens, that, God, yo, that's, that's insane. I honestly think, though, like, if he hadn't gone to party, right, and he doesn't get kicked off of that squad, I don't think much changes. I think it may have even been worse for him theoretically mm. because let's say he doesn't go to that party. They win. Now he gets an even bigger contract, right? Way more expectation, but it's still not home. So all the feelings that he's having about playing there and, you know, trying to connect to something that doesn't change because you won the U21 world cup or whatever, or euros, whatever it was. Um, that none of that changes so those feelings are still affecting the player so for me i don't see much changing had he not gone to that party but it's interesting that he did and the trajectory that the career took but i think that's also like it's just his plan that's how it has to play out for him yeah i think so it might have oh. oh go ahead Oh, I don't know. I was going to ask Rocks if it's like it's almost like Mario Bellatari's there. Like if he gets the big contract, there's a situation where KP isn't going to Ghana and connected to his roots, like you say he was, right? Right, right. Because there's mean, a world that mean for him. Yeah, there's a work like there's another possibility where <clears throat> we talked about a Mario Bellatelli episode where Mario could have gone to Ghana and been part of that national team as well. So you could have mm-hmm. had a front three of. The IU brothers, KP, and Mario. Mm-hmm. But Mario decided to go to Italy. And I think if Mario had made that decision to go to Ghana, totally different career. In the same way where we're having this discussion about KP, I think if Mario goes to Ghana in that time, different trajectory. Because it's really like, I can't imagine for them, like, I understand, you know, me being myself here on US soil and like trying to find something to connect to because I'm a descendant of American chattel slavery. Like what am I supposed to be so prideful about? Like this country is, this is my homeland. My whole claim is here. So, you know, not feeling the love from the homeland. I can understand. I can relate to that and wanting to connect to something. I can relate to that, but I don't, I just don't have the option to, you know, debate between here and some other place. Like this is it for me. So, you know, what that means for my trajectory or their trajectory is up for debate, but it's it's cool to think about, um, especially for Mario. Um, KP, you know, that result is that result. He chose Ghana. Um, I think that keeps him playing. You know, I think if he if he didn't do that, he may not even be playing now. You know, there's that possibility as well. So, you know, there are just so many threads and strings to run down. What if this? What if that? It's all interesting, but the key point that I will always tie this conversation back to is that those early starts, that early education on what they had ac- access to, um, what was available to them in the household, that is what ultimately shaped them. And then after that, once you've already formed your ideas about the world, it's hard to shake off of them. Yeah. And this is something like I'm pretty sure you guys will get into about the podcast as well. What does it mean to be an international football player? But like, We've seen it multiple times. So, like, you get deals based on 
like who you represent. Because like in case of England, Raheem Sterling, he can really be a part of this Jamaican national team. Doesn't happen. He goes play for England, gets his big move to Man City. But you look at the flip side of it, Wilfred Zaha pretty much got, I wanted to say pressure, but kind of moved to be part of the England national team. Gets moved to Manchester United. Doesn't work on United, wherever the case may be. Comes back to Crystal Palace. Never really gets called back in because he's not at a big six club. <clears throat> and then he goes to the Ivory Coast. You know, why is it is that certain certain footballers, especially African footballers, feel the need to represent these big nations when it comes to football? Because Economics. at the end, of, exactly. At the end of the day, they trying to get the bag, bro. And you can't really blame them for, for that. You only yeah. have so much time as an athlete. And in that time, you have to maximize your opportunity, period. So I am always rooting for black players getting the bag, whatever bag is available to them, get it while you can, because you're only really going to get 18 to say 30 if you're lucky, um, maybe 18 to 27, uh, depending on your skill level. But whatever the case is, you have a, a finite window to get what you can and set your family up to be generations ahead of where you were in your own life. These African ballers are coming from, whether they come directly from the motherland born there or not, they still have that story, right? And they want to create opportunity where they did not have or where their parents did not have. You know, imagine, you know, Jerome, Kevin, and George listening to their father say, you know, back in Ghana, it was rough. I came here specifically to help create something for you that I, that was never going to be available to me. I'm trying to create it for you. And they did it. Right. So that's the ultimate success story. They're generations ahead of where their father was because of a game of soccer. So every opportunity they have to get that money, they have to think about those decisions. Like I'm sure a lot of players, they want to play for, you know, their parents team, or they want to play, um, you know, just for the culture or whatever. But at the end of the day, you got to be able to prepare yourself for whatever is coming and you got to pay for it, whatever is coming. So they have to make the most of these opportunities while they can. Yeah. And I mean, I, like, I'll give you guys a tip. Like me and Shannon are getting ready to do an episode on the uh, 2018 French national team. Like the, we already got it written out. Like the story of that team is Africa's first World Cup because I think out of the the 24 footballers on that team, 18 of them have some kind of tie back to Africa. But right. if you, in the first I mean, or you second really generation. look at that team, like, yeah, for, right. Like Mbappe could really be on that Cameroon squad. Paul Pogba, another good one who we could have done a whole episode about. His brothers played for uh, African nation. The, the name of the country is escaping me right now. But, like, he could, he could have been playing there. Um, Conte, a whole bunch of players, especially coming from Africa. And one football we were talking about, Nicholas Anaka, um, he definitely talked about it. His uh, story that's on Netflix, which was, it was one of the best soccer documentaries I've watched in the pandemic. It he talked about it where. the best soccer documentary I've ever seen outside the Pele one. Probably so. Probably so. Um, but he, he is one point in the movie where he talks about how. He knew he had to play for France because playing for France was an extra ten, twenty thousand dollars, whatever he signed a contract. If he decides like, oh, I want to go for my nation, not my home squad, that's ten, twenty thousand dollars less, and that's just wild. Just to think like, oh, being a French international means that this is a whole different level of access, and we this is a concept we can have a whole different talk about. Maybe we could talk about when I get invited on the Top Soccer Pod about access just based on where you're from. And that's why I really feel like the, the Boateng Brothers story is all about. It's just about access. It's just about you just happen to be born 18 months late. You just happen to be 18 months later. Two different trajectories because yep. at the end of the day, we're still talking about Jerome Boateng is one of the not at least center backs, but one of the better center backs out there. And we're talking about Kevin Prince Boateng and his squad fighting for promotion in Syria B. Just it just happens how it played out. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think one thing we can say, like without a doubt, is that Kevin Prince Boateng, whether he knew it or not, cost himself a lot of money that night. Like, oh, yeah, for sure. um, you know, just the value of like, you know, passports, even when you travel, like, you know, especially being like a person of color, like, you know, if you travel internationally, like, you know, you got that American passport, like, you know, shit hits a little different than like, you know, if you had any other passport. So, I mean, like, you know, the value of like, you know, what that stamp do, like, you know, really means a lot in ways that people might not understand. And like, you know, if you look at people like Anelka, um, if you look at people like Balotelli, like, you know, especially when it comes to like Kevin Prince Boateng, like the level of club he probably ended up bouncing around to, like also was really affected by this decision. Right. Because like, you know, at a minimum, at least if he was like a German international, like, you know, it might not have been Portsmouth. It might have been like a bottom half like premier league team like you know like at that time it might have been like everton or something like you know you don't really like you know you don't really know but you know for sure that like different people get different looks because of the stamp on their passport before anything else yeah that's yeah that's that's how it comes down to man um but we i just want to thank you guys so much for taking time out of your day for hopping on to the podcast man this has been Probably one of the most intriguing conversations I've had, man, because like this conversation, like I said, like we can do part two, part three, part four about this just yeah, because yeah, yeah. of how much you can get into the weeds about the subject, man. That's what I love about mm -hmm. it. Um, Yo, if we wanted to, we could do a whole episode on that night because like apparently <laughs> – like apparently there's a whole bunch of articles written about it. Like if you just go back and like look it up, like there's a lot of like material on like, you know, what allegedly was like going on at that time. Oh so I mean, God. like we could break all that down if we wanted to. We could be here all night, bro. Look, we might we might have to save that for the fans for our part two. Part two, <laughs> yeah, part two, yeah. part two. Part two might be coming. Oh uh, man, but where can everyone reach out to you guys at, man? Where 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 can everyone connect with you guys at? You already know what it is at Chop Soccer Pod. That's me, Ken, and Shanoa. Um, if you want to reach out to us individually, Ken is always changing his Twitter handle. So right now is Barbie's favorite Ken. That's Barbie's F A V Ken. It might be different in two weeks. Don't blame me. <laughs> no, we're gonna stick with that one for a while. That one's getting some traction. Yeah, I'm there. not gonna lie. Kids intros of the chop soccer has me dying laughing it. because he'll go <laughs> on like a five minute like roll call. You know, it's just like <laughs> <laughs> we might have to bring it back. We might have to bring it back. People seem to miss it. <laughs> yeah, and uh I am at Rox Fontaine everywhere, and Shanoa is on Twitter at Shanoa G, and that's S H A. N N O A H letter G as in gangster. Hey, yo, the pod is really, uh, the pod is really Shinoa and friends. Like, uh, <laughs> you just want to keep it a hundred, basically. <laughs> like, uh, so big shout out to her. We miss her. Yeah, we do. It would be great if she was here. She would yeah. have no idea about this conversation, but as far as like the economics of it and the you know, the blackness of it. She's always on time with those. So we appreciate her and we love watching her develop her soccer journey right in front of our, all of our eyes. Right. That's kind of why we wanted her on. She was like, I don't really know about soccer, but the fact that she was willing to just jump on a soccer podcast tells you everything you need to know about her. Like she is willing nah, to right. go out, try things, explore and, and develop. I yeah. And really tap dope. in. Oh, no, I, was oh, just gonna, I think it was dope about how, like, I think y'all was doing the tribute episode to DMX, and y'all got in a conversation about the N word, and she was just like, "Yeah, I don't feel bad." <laughs> I'm just gonna say, it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, she's uh, she's picking teams now too for uh, MLS and oh. NWSL. So, like, hop on uh, at Chop Soccer Pod, like you know, uh, at Shinoa G. Um, and uh, like, you know, help us figure out which teams she know I should support. Like, you know, show us some love. Where is she? she is she from LA? Like born and raised? No, no. She's from Tucson, Arizona. Phoenix I mean, rising. Got, stand she, up. Woo -woo. She got FC Tucson right in her backyard. Go there. USL yeah. League one, baby. 
Yeah. Go be the only black fan there. It, <laughs> <don't get> <laughs> <laughs> um, but listeners, as always, thank you guys for checking out this latest episode of Can I Kick It? As always, you can follow us on River City 93. If you want to be a supporter of this podcast, you can. This is for the low, low fee of a dollar a month. You know, it helps you bring more content like this. It helps us improve the audio, stuff like this. And, you know, we bring you more exclusive stories with special guest hosts like the shop soccer guys um and the link to that will be down in the description down below as always this is elliot these are my friends thank you guys for going down this unique start we'll holler at you guys later you know the vibes